This series of lunchtime conversations intends to capture insights from some of society's thought leaders in these times. It's the 18th of May, and here in the UK, we're beginning to consider how to plan for recovery, whatever form that's going to take. Part of my role at Warwick University is to make sure our education programmes remain relevant and continue to serve the needs of society. To do this, it's important to be part of the research and industry community, and the people that I will speak to in this series form my professional network, and I rely on them to inform and help steer our educational offerings. We've seen seismic shifts in all areas of life. The extraordinarily pervasive nature of COVID-19 will have lasting effects. With me today to discuss, I have Peter Lynham. Peter, welcome to lunch. Thank you very much, Mary. Very nice to be here. Thanks for asking me along. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you could join me today because you are the inspiration behind this lunchtime series. Wow. Well, yeah, indeed, I know. Last time we met was the week before lockdown. We were just in the process of um, moving our classes online. So at Warwick University, lots of the students, nobody was coming into class, but we had a class scheduled that week and you came up and delivered with Daniel Steenstra and, and, and as he led the product design and development management module. Um, and that's a module that you have delivered on and you have kept um, engagement with us and through that module for, for many, many years now. Um, I took I took the opportunity to catch up with you over lunch, as lunch with you never fails to be interesting, insightful and valuable. Um, so true to form, true to form, you um, talked about crisis situations you have overseen at British Airways. Um, and I wondered, you know, do any of those crises, do any of them stand out particularly in your mind? And 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 what what about them stands out and maybe has relevance to the crisis situation we're in today? Yeah, great question. Um, I think the one that really stands out was the Icelandic volcano. Um, I won't attempt to pronounce it. I think it was 56 letters long or something um, around about 2010. Um, and that was the sort of thing which we, we'd often mused about in the pub beforehand, but nobody really thought that anything like that would happen in our lifetime and our careers. So we hadn't put a huge amount of effort into contingency planning. And I think perhaps we'll come back to that later, but that taught us a lesson about um, how we have to plan for the unthinkable. But what we found there was it was uh, pretty easy for all the various stakeholders, whether they be um, the government, the regulators, the airlines, air traffic control, uh, customers, the media, um, Everybody could see that it was sensible to pause flying. Um, but then we had the devil's own job persuading people that it was safe to fly again. And in fact, I think there are still some people around who officially think it, it, it's still unsafe to fly um, aircraft with large aero engines now because um, the criteria that they set down um, to say this is when it's safe to go fly again were never met. So in the end, um, the criteria were kind of adjusted to facilitators um, going back flying again. Um, but whereas it's very easy to stop doing something, um, it's incredibly difficult to restart it. Uh, and I think. And, and from, from that, you know, from this restarting it and the criteria you set to restart, in a situation that we're in at the moment where there are so many, um, just so many unknowns and the United Kingdom is no longer united in its approach to reopening yeah. back up. Um, how, if if you don't close until you know how you're going to reopen, how can you how how can you know what that is in such an uncertain situation? Or or at least what what um, what types of conversations would you be expecting to have to be able to get a better understanding on how to clearly communicate that? Yeah, I think. Above all, you have to be absolutely clear who is accountable, finally. Um, whose advice uh, are you using? What are the metrics? What is the target you're going to be aiming at? So um, if you're looking for um, a restart after volcanic ash, you, you set a criteria which is parts per million of, of ash or something like that. Um, and then everybody is clear and they can, they can watch the number every day. And I think 
we've watched these government briefings every day at five o'clock. It's, it's the highlight of my day sometimes when it's been a quiet day. And you see all the metrics and of course they, they went up alarmingly and now they're coming down slowly. The number of cases, the number of hospital admissions, number of deaths, etc. Um, but nowhere on those graphs is a target line. And I think that's what everybody's been looking for. Um, and I think if you have a line and then you realise that maybe it wasn't appropriate, new evidence comes in, I, I think it's OK to, to move the target if you like. But yes. it seems in this instance we haven't actually well, we've not been told as the general public what the target is, maybe uh, behind the scenes. Um, mm. Maybe some people do know. Mm, yeah, yes, because even the sort of criteria that have been stated by the government are quite broad statements of the NHS having enough capacity. Yeah. And I think you have to, to go back to what I was saying about you work out who's accountable. Everybody will bring different evidence to the party you've got. In, in this instance, you've got so many different computer models from various uh, academic institutions um, and, and they will obviously come up with a different answer every time because that's what computer models do but you've got to be clear which one are we actually using which is the live one and, and, and which are the ones um, that we're, we're going to take into account uh, but not uh, let them hold the ring same thing goes on with weather forecasting i mean i i have mused as we've gone through this um whether we should have weather forecast trying to explain the models every day at five o'clock because obviously you've got kind of scientists and public health officials there who will have had some media training but that's not their real job yes. uh, whereas you know the, the weather computers just produce megabytes of information every second and then somebody has to synthesize that to 30 seconds on the news that we can all understand mm. yep yeah okay yes that is interesting communications communications seem to be you know, from from the area I've I've been involved with in 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 watching how business and research is evolving, communication seems to become becoming more and more and more critical. And um, yeah. how do you this balancing? I I think you've answered. I think Tanya had asked a question previously about how do you balance that, um, sharing the information you've got between instilling panic. You know, how do you yeah. um and I mean, the UK at the moment, I think, is not a confident, a confident nation in no. knowing how to respond to what's been asked of them. Um, how would you, how could you or how may you remedy that to communicate effectively rather than, or, or, or do you feel they are communicating effectively? I, th I think to be fair, they're doing a really good job. I mean, mm. not none of them would have kind of voted for this when they applied for the job in their careers, obviously. Mm. And quite a few people seem to be new in post as well. So I think it's important to say they are doing a really good job. I think it is about establishing what the metric is and then what the target is along that metric, because then people can make their own mind up as they see the numbers go up or down they've got a context and they've got a frame of reference in which to pitch yes. that but if you just see uh, a graph where a line appears to be going up exponentially you are likely to panic un un unless you are kind of in the trade if you like and, mm -hmm. and and you have inherently that kind of knowledge so i think it is about sharing the targets Mm. And and we've kind of uh, from I mean this in terms of crisis this is a crisis that has been an extended crisis. Yeah. This idea of kind of crisis fatigue is there yeah. such a thing? And what does yeah. how does that manifest? What's that like? Absolutely, there is crisis fatigue, and I see great differences in the airline clients that I have in their level of preparedness. And I think. Um, what we've had recently it was kind of um, overshadowed by this crisis, sadly, but um, during the time we've all been knocked out, locked down, it was the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 13 mission, uh, which for uh, many of our viewers and listeners, they probably weren't born in um, 1970 when it happened. But most people are aware of it was the moon mission that went wrong and Houston, we have a problem and all the rest of it. And if you if you watch the movie, which obviously is a, a dramatization, um, but also if you read the book by Jim Lovell, and if you listen to the series of podcasts that the BBC World Service have done recently, um, one of the things that's obvious is that um, in mission control to this day, um, they have a very rigid shift or watch system. So each person in each position, in, including the person who's overall in charge, the flight director, 
is only allowed to work for eight hours. Um, and the guy who was on duty when the explosion happened on Apollo 13 only had, I think, about 45 minutes to go on his shift. Um, and they rapidly realized the ship was losing oxygen and power and whatever. And, you know, that that was going to run out in an hour. So there must have been a huge temptation for him to stay in the chair. Um, but actually, no, as soon as the 45 minutes were up, he handed over to the next guy um, who came in with a fresh set of eyes and ears. And they're all working to the same criteria. They were all working to the same procedures. Um, so it shouldn't matter who's in the chair. Um, but you know that that person who's been relieved will be needed the next day. And of course, what we've seen now is it goes on day after day. So yeah. when I worked at, at BA, we always had a system. We we assumed we were going to have two crises running at the same time, uh, which very occasionally we did, but it was once every 10 years or so. So we had enough people trained up that you could manage an aircraft incident, say, in America, um, together with some technology issue in London or something like that. The other thing that NASA did, um, there's another great example in Apollo 13, they set up separate teams to plan for the future. So all the time they were trying to save the ship and conserve oxygen and power and whatever, they realized they'd have other problems about how to navigate without a computer and whatever. So they delegated a whole team, which they call the Tiger team, to go and sit in a separate room and work on that. So for the airlines at the moment, what we're advising is you should have a totally separate group of people from the people who are managing the crisis from day to day, who are planning for the eventual restart and maybe wave two of the virus and whatever else happens. And that is difficult because it needs a lot of people. Um, so um, obviously there'll be a Rolls Royce solution for it and there'll be a Ford Fiesta solution for it. But but if you ignore it altogether, um, you are going to struggle as any kind of entity, particularly in airline. It's, I mean, it needs a lot of people, and I guess it also would require some skillful coordination between the yeah. two teams, um, which I guess, it's an expertise that um, we don't practice that often. You know, if, if we have mm. got it, we don't get the opportunity to roll it out and really practice it that often. And I think that's, I, I, I guess, it, that kind of that ability to, to have the knowledge from experience we yeah. don't we don't have it so that's right i think some professions have it um mm. and you and i we used to fly to the other side of the world and deliver our lectures so you'd be flying to hong kong and there'd always be two sets of crew on the airplane the first crew flies it for the first six hours and then they hand over to the second crew and the reason that that works is because those people um establish procedures for the safe flying of an airplane um, and they are tested on that twice a year in a simulator and signed off and all the rest of it so that when the second crew get out of their sleeping quarters in the middle of the night over Siberia, they don't have to second guess what the first crew have done and check all the operation of the switches and all the rest of it because they know and they trust because everybody's working to the same procedures. And those are people who may, if you're an airline pilot in a big airline, you might never fly with the same lady or the same man um, more than once a year. Um, so you can't know what their particular uh, way of doing things are, their sort of emotional state, anything else. You've got to rely on the fact that they're following standard procedures. Mm, yeah. And um, something else you talked about when we were at lunch that time, which was just, just before that lockdown, that I thought was was just really interesting, fascinating, was that you were, you were at that point, you were already talking to other um, airline representatives that or, or network that you had about maybe looking at possibly redeploying um, some of the cabin crew yeah. of different airlines who would now be, I'm not sure, even sure at the time if they'd even talked about furloughing at the time we were having the conversation, but the cabin crews that no longer could fly could potentially be redeployed because every cabin crew is trained to a level of first aid yeah. and trained in administering oxygen yeah. so they had that opportunity and uh, as a as at the same time that was the same time when the big kind of the press were really all over the the ventilator challenge yeah. and yeah. looking at um sort of maybe larger asset um solutions to the problem and what you were talking about with the cabin crew was more about getting those that already had skills to 
um, maybe before ventilators were needed to administer oxygen and, and yeah. get involved. Um, sorry for the rambly question, but what, what was um, what really what what was really intriguing to me was how do you have that network and then how do you how do you have the conversation to have the influence because that's a real sideways thought for someone like me that's yeah. a bit like oh that's thinking sideways how do you get the ear of government to have those conversations to be able to yeah. have that um accepted and then uh, quickly um enacted within within the, the coping of covid yeah, um, I think you almost have to forget my answers to the previous questions when I was stressing standard procedures and whatever, because for something like this, you, you have to go off process, frankly. If you approach the government or National Health Service trusts or airlines um, with that kind of suggestion, it will go through endless committees and people won't be reading their email because they're in crisis and all the rest of it. So you have to use your networks, which is um, one of the benefits of what we're doing today is all about networking. Mm -hmm. um, so you know who is in a position of influence, who can actually make a decision, whether it's in the government or the NHS or the airlines, um, and put that idea in front of them. So it, it was as simple in this instance as sending WhatsApp. So I sent one WhatsApp to Willie Walsh, who's the uh, chief executive of the BA holding company. One of my colleagues uh, that I work with has a job advising the cabinet office. Um, and one of my other colleagues uh, approached Virgin Atlantic and EasyJet at the same time. And basically it was just a series of WhatsApp messages. And, and by lunchtime, the idea had germinated. Um, and then it was just a question of um, looking at the practicalities. And I think um, it was by the end of the week, I think I did this at the start of the week, and by the end of the week, um, the announcements were being made that uh, those people were being deployed. And that was around the time when the decision had been taken to build the Nightingale hospitals. Um, and yeah, it's fine, you build a, a facility like that, um, but that's just an empty shell until you put machinery in, until you put people uh, yeah. to operate the machinery. So it was, you know, we have a demand for healthcare assistance, for the want of a better word, and where can we get supply? Uh, well, yeah, we can go to manpower, we can call some people back from early retirement or whatever, but we knew um, that there were tens of thousands of cabin crew, even before the official furlough scheme, who, who had nothing to do. Um, because the one thing the airline industry is, is very labour intensive. It takes lots of people to fly planes around the world because the plane carries on forever, but the crew have to get off every 10 hours and have a rest for a couple of days. Um, so I knew that, you know, we probably had well over 20, 25,000 flight attendants who were um, just looking for a job, if you like. And as you say, um, they are trained to um, basic um, medical standards. Uh, they're used to administering oxygen on just about every long haul flight. Somebody has a need of therapeutic oxygen and they have very good customer service skills as well. And I think one of the stories we've heard repeatedly during this crisis is if you are admitted to hospital and still worse, if you go into intensive care, you're on your own. You know, your family can't be with you. Your friends can't be with you. And I spoke to a friend of mine who had it. Um, at the weekend and he said it was a, it was literally a frightening experience and you start hallucinating you think about your own mortality and all the rest of it so um, you do see similar events sometimes on a smaller scale on board long-haul aircraft because it's it's a strange environment people find themselves in the middle of the night all the lights are off and you can't sleep and you're jet lagged yes. or whatever people do have strange thoughts so cabin crew are used to going down sitting with people and just kind of calming them down and providing a um, almost a shoulder to cry on on occasion. So it, it, it seemed a fantastic fit to me. So I'm really glad that it happened. Yeah, yes, yes. Well, yeah, I imagine many people are very glad it happened too. Yeah. Um, and I guess kind of maybe looking ahead, looking ahead. So the idea of um, air travel, it's it's not looking good for many airlines. It's not. And, <laughs> no, it's not. And actually, just society's appetite for air travel probably will be reduced um, and yeah. for all sorts of good reasons and um, that may mean that they don't pick it back up again. So I imagine business travel will reduce in the long term and um, because people realise they can work 
virtually, not completely, not di disappeared altogether, but many of the, the needs to travel for business have been clearly, but some business has been effective without having air travel. So and um, that doesn't need to come back again. And then, of course, the benefits for the environment and that we've yeah. seen, you know, it's so what do you foresee? I mean, how what what would you predict with all these different these changes? Some are going to last. Yeah. What do you see the future and um, how do you see it? How do you see it panning out? Well, I think I understand exactly what everybody's been saying, that companies have become used to remote working. Um, I think um, obviously some jobs are impossible to do. I, I listened to the chairman of British Aerospace who said they hadn't found a way of building a submarine from home yet, but they were still trying. Um, <laughs> So just to set the counter argument, um, I think what I would say is that for as many years as I've been working, we've had the telephone. It's been, pos it's been possible to have remote meetings. It might not have had video with it. And that didn't stop um, huge growth in business travel. Yes. Um, the technology isn't perfect. It's very difficult. Um, I suppose as people use it more and more, you will establish better meeting discipline. But it's almost impo impossible to have a decent argument over Zoom or Teams or something like that. Um, so I think it will cut out some of the business travel, but I defy anybody to say that in a large company, you would sign a contract with somebody you've never met. And yes. you'd, you'd never met both formally over a boardroom table and you'd never met having a drink in the bar or something like that. Mm. And I spoke to um, a client who was, um, from the Far East and he was um, running an investment bank in London and his view on this was that um, as soon as somebody starts a trend, so say it's China as the country that yes. kind of came out of the, the pandemic first, as soon as they start traveling then it will force other people to travel even if they're a bit unsure about doing so and they're not happy about spending time at the airport being checked because if you've got somebody doing business on a face-to-face -face basis they are going to steal a march on the opposition who are just saying, well, I'll phone you up or I'll join you for teams or something like that. So yeah. it will come back, but it will take a long time to come back. And the industry thinks it will be three to five years. I think for leisure customers, I think you've got different issues. And probably the best parallel there is the 9-11 security issue, where in order to get people back on aeroplanes again, you had to be 100% confident that the people sat next to you were not armed terrorists. And the way that we did that was to establish all sorts of security procedures, which we're all familiar with now at the airport. So to get people in any numbers flying again for leisure, you will have to be confident that that person sat next to you is not carrying the disease. Now, how that's done is down to experts other than me uh, in terms of whether it's a vaccine or testing or whatever. But mm -hmm you'll have to instill that level of confidence, I think, to, to move forward. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, reflecting on my own my own practice, you know, I um, I really appreciate having had and um, being able to catch up with you for for nigh on maybe 15 years over a lunchtime catch up. And that, um, I mean, I think the value that you deliver to our students when you lecture, I mean, it just it, it's always you're always fantastic at, at lecturing and the students love it you know they rise they rise to having you in the classroom and um, I think for me you know having that um informal lunchtime conversation with you has been so valuable to, to help inform me and to maintain a, a network relationship over a period of time right. and I I think maybe if we had had to rely completely upon a virtual get together over lunch um, I'm not sure we would have lasted for 15 years. No, um, I think that's right. I think the the virtual stuff builds on the base of the face to face contact. And I don't know about you, but I often think that if you and I have lunch or have a drink or something like that and you say something to me or vice versa, I'm much more likely to remember that than I am if you'd sent me something in an email five years ago because mm -hmm. I've got a context that oh I was in this bar when you told me or I was sat on this aeroplane or, or whatever and I, I think just the human memory um, can bring things back um, from way back there in its data bank if, if it's got a context that the incident happened in or something mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why um, I, I, I can talk forever on crisis management and all the things I got involved in. 
Um, and I think I, I can do that because I was there live. But if I read textbooks about how other people manage their crises, I probably absorb about 50 percent of it, to be honest, because yeah. because I wasn't there and I have no yes. context to, to place it in. Mm. Yeah, well, well, thank you very much indeed for sharing these insights with us, Peter. And um, for me, you know, they're enormously useful and I will use the insights to inform my practice and, and the programmes I might might be responsible for. Um, for our current students that are listening to this, this is um, lovely data for all those students to use in their research projects. And for the wider Warwick community, there's value um, to hear this and to be part of the network. So thank you very much. If anybody listening to this um, would like to hear from Peter, then just drop me a line and I'll forward it on. Um, I'm sure you can find him on LinkedIn or Twitter as well, he's there. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can follow the link on the closing slide. And this series will also be made available as a podcast. So just search Insights Over Lunch and whatever you listen to your podcasts on. Um, again, thank you very much, Peter. And I guess there's nothing more to say apart from um, enjoy, enjoy your virtual lunch. Thank you very much, Mary. It's been great talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah,